Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Sprites of Life podcast. I'm Lucas. I'm Chris. And I'm Don. So glad to have you back for another episode. And Don, glad to have you back. You kind of jumped ahead on what we're going to talk about this episode because you went to Utah. How was that? It was great. Um, Yeah, I went there, uh, visited a friend that lives out there, did some uh, ice fishing. Uh, Yeah, it was a good time. You fully committed to the uh, snow team bit. I did actually have to play um, some of my, my GC games off my friend's phone's hotspot while out on the ice. So I did commit. To, the snow team was not the pick for the GC. This is kind of the worst I've ever done. But I had a lot of disconnects from trying to play while ice fishing. Being on a hotspot on the middle of the lake. <laughs> yeah, so that would definitely um, affected it a little bit. But um, yeah, I kept the snow theme going. Um, the fishing was good. Got some cool fish. Got some uh, of the native cutthroat trout in the area and um, some landlocked salmon. And I, you know, just just beautiful out there. You know, cool mountains, snow, saw some elk. Just a good time. That just it sounds beautiful, but awful because I can't stand the cold. Oh, it wasn't yet, that cold. cold. I got when I got uh, what, there. What is it, not that cold? Okay, well, so the valley floor was like forty three, so like not even freezing. And then up in um at the the reservoir we were at was like high twenties into the thirties. Except for the last day, it was like low twenties, and the wind chill had it at like twelve. But uh, we had like a pop up tent that we got so it wasn't uh you know once you're out of the wind you know get the little grill going and stuff it's pretty good it just sounds awful again we're doing an ice type episode today i hope that was kind of obvious from the title but even still i hate the cold so much everyone around me knows it and yet here we are i hope you all appreciate what i do for people listening because i really don't like ice I like the idea that you left Florida and you moved to South Carolina and now you're like I hate the cold and it's South Carolina cold yeah, no, it's, I mean, today I was literally working outside and the wind chill was down to 40 with rain. It was freezing. I hated it. Every I second. wear shorts in 40 degree weather. I wear shorts in a t-shirt. With the rain hitting you with a wind chill? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's vile. You all should be condemned. Ugh. All right, before we get to cold and learning about ice and learning about how animals survive ice and all that other stuff, I do want to get to adorable news. Because we get to talk about Baby Shark, and it doesn't have to involve the song. But it should. Uh, so some people have caught on to this. Um, it got a lot of traction earlier last week um, that there is now the first video ever of a newborn great white shark. And that is incredible. Because to be quite honest and adorable, look at him. Like if you've never seen the picture of him, like the life science has a great little article about him. The ver- everyone has the picture. Now this photo was taken in July of last year. And the research paper that came out of it, that only was let's see. The paper is called novel aerial observations of possible newborn white shark. That was only published on the 29th of January. So it's a relatively new article and it's gotten through a lot of studies. It's really cool that it was being seen, and it was found off the uh, coast of California near the border of Mexico. It's very cool. Like, if you look at it, like, it's covered in, like, this white, weird fluid that is basically what is the nutrients for these sharks when they're inside the um, the inside the mother. And then the, once they come out, they start shedding some of that off. So this is, like, new newborn. This thing is so cute. And then they just casually, oh, I guess they, they don't change color. They just shed that and then they take on their traditional coloring. Yeah, they will over time. Um, They will eventually darken up and their body will get coloration. But this is huge. Um, Great whites are a threatened species. So now that we know where they are generally, like where they could potentially be reproducing, there have been other studies that show that this area in SoCal has large female pregnant sharks in the area. If we can learn more about how these animals reproduce and where they're going, you could eventually use that information to help the species out. Because currently, great white sharks are very well known, and they also can get hunted, fished, and brutalized in other ways just because, well, Jaws. Jaws Jaws did not help the PR of great white sharks. No, it did not. Everyone wanted their own Jaws, and then shark finning popped up. No, I, I honestly think this is really cool because shark any shark news that is positive and not about people getting hurt by them, fantastic for the species. Fantastic for all of the species of sharks out there. No, no, he's just a little guy. He's just a little guy. I mean, look at him. His tail's not even sharp yet. Like, the tails still have the roundedness of their embryo form. Like, it, it really is, like, 
a few days, if not a few hours old, maybe like one day old at most, according to one of the statements that the authors wrote in. That is an incredible find. And I'm so glad that the general population is learning about it as opposed to just a bunch of science lovers. But no, it's I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just giddy. Look, he's just a cute little guy. Oh, my goodness. But um, as far as gaming goes, I mean, it is February. So Pokemon Day will come up by the end of the month. We'll definitely talk about that. But apparently over the weekend, there were a ton of leaks that came out um, about Xbox. Did you guys hear about those? You mentioned something about it, but I haven't really followed up on it too much. No, I, I, I've heard a few of them, but which ones are you wanting to talk about? The big one being that after the recent, let's say, lack of success of things like Starfield and some of these other games that Bethesda has put their weight behind, that Xbox is potentially moving towards moving some of their console exclusives to the PlayStation 5, which is pretty big given the millions and millions of dollars they spent on Bethesda just to make sure that they could have more exclusivity. And it, it's not going well for them. Do you want to guess how much money they spent on Bethesda just to make sure it would be like their exclusive to choose with? Take a guess how much money they spent. One million dollars. 80 million. 7.5 billion dollars to buy ZeniMax Media, the parent company. They spent 7.5 billion dollars to make sure that they would have the exclusive rights to sell Bethesda games like Elder Scroll, Fallout to themselves if they choose. And now they're basically having to circle back for whatever reason to be, hey, maybe we should not be so exclusive so we can sell more stuff. It's, it's not the biggest news in the world, but like people are joking like, man, who would have thought the day where we might actually get to play Halo on a PlayStation? You'll never play Halo on a PlayStation. And that's what I say. That's what I think as well. Like there's, they would never allow it. But I mean... I still wanted y'all's thoughts on it because, I mean, we have at least one Xbox player here. So you're the one. Do you feel bad that you're not getting exclusive games? Uh, I don't because I don't care about it because I typically buy both consoles. What I mostly am going to be grumpy about are the PlayStation fanboys who are making comments about it because it's just like, I don't understand. Like, why is more people getting access to games a bad thing? Or why is it something worth, like, deriding a company for? Like, sure, they're doing it for money. Sure, maybe it's not working out the way they planned. But why is more people getting access to games a bad thing? For me, I've always been a Sony boy because I like my Japanese games. And Japanese companies don't make them for Xbox. That's it. That's all it ever was. Nothing personal. But that's, that's like... I don't know what reasons they have. It could be... It probably is money. It could be money. But... They've all like Xbox has been making a big push for gaming is for everyone as their bit, so that kind of plays into it. But also, maybe they're not recouping as much as they want to on Game Pass. So, uh, if they could sell make up some sales on PlayStation and Switch, then that might make up some of the Game Pass losses. And I would hate to see Game Pass change because I love it. Game Pass is probably one of the best things Xbox has ever created. So, yeah, no, don't lose that. That's great. I don't know. It, it sucks, but at the same time, we almost always talk about Nintendo products, and if we're going to talk about console exclusivity and Nintendo, we're going to be at this a while. We are more likely to see the uh, Halo on the PlayStation 5 than we are to see Pokemon on any other console. This is true. This is true. Yeah. <laughs> They're more likely to let you play Halo on a TI-83 calculator than you are to see Nintendo giving God, up Pokemon's rights. Sticks, lasting the Covenant in, like, in calculus. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I do want to talk about this because I do like doing these type videos, even though ice types are not my favorite. Honestly, they're not Pokemon's favorite either. There are only 65 ice Pokemon in the game. That's it. It's the least typage of any of them, even dragons. I was trying to remember back in Gen 1, because I, I first thought that other than, um, I was like, other than dragon, it had to have the fewest types. And that was wrong. Ghost. Yeah, ghost. What was the other one? I'm pretty sure, wait, how many psychic were in the, were in the first one? Aggie, the Aggies, the Slowpokes, Starmie, Mewtwo, and Mew. And Abra, Kadabra, Alakazam, Mr. Mime, okay, Jinx. So, so it's actually a lot of psychic. Wow. 
Ice might be drowsy good, hypno. Then. Ice might be third most populated then, right? No, Ice was like so back then. Ice it was Dugong, Cloyster, Jinx, Lapras, Articuno. Yeah, so they they had the second most Pokemon. And now, over twenty five years later, they still only have sixty five. They probably have the le- they probably have the least now. They, they do, do have the least. It is it is the least. Like even the dragons have more than they do. But it's wild to me because like ice type, it I mean like it's a staple in so much RPG and fiction and all these other things to have ice powers, to have ice magic, to use freeze guns and what have you. Be it your black mage using ice it, ice spells in Final Fantasy to Mister Freeze's cold gun. Ice in fiction is a weapon for so many different things. But a lot of people, when you talk about it, like most people don't even know the definition of what cold is. Like cold is it like when it's freezing outside, it's not that we got more cold. Cold is just the absence of heat. And in that absence of heat, different reactions occur. You know, the freezing of water and the air turns to ice. All these different climate effects occur as well. Um, I kind of wanted to talk about how so many different organisms have learned to survive in cold climates. Because at least on land, cold is honestly pretty detrimental to life. Look at Antarctica. How many things can actually live out there? It's freezing. And not only freezing, it's so devoid of any kind of life except for weird moss and penguins. You have to go into the ocean to get anything good out of it. But everything has to be able to survive at some kind of threshold at high or low. And for some animals, um, the the survival threshold is a lot better on one side than the other and some animals have adapted to surviving in frozen icy conditions and we've gotten some pretty cool pokemon based on them um now we've talked about it in the past but don's more familiar than i am um you want to explain bergman's rule real quick yeah so um it's not a hard and fast rule and it mainly applies to mammals but generally bergman's rule is that Mammals of the same species are larger on the farther northern or southern part. Closer, I guess you say closer to the poles for our southern hemisphere friends. Um, the farther you get from the equator, the larger they get. Um, it's like it's you can see it pretty easily with white-tailed deer in North America, where down in like Florida and Texas, white-tailed deer can be like very small, like the size of like a large dog or a medium-sized dog when you get down to key deer. But then if you go up into Canada, you're looking at, like, white-tailed deer, you can easily break 200 pounds. And it's, like, a very, very like, clear example of it. But it applies to um, not every mammal. Some bear species deviate from it. But um, it's most commonly seen in mammals because the bigger you get, the less surface area to body size you have, so you lose less heat. You also see it in bald eagles, which is one of the rare exception of not mammals. Like yeah, some bird, birds. Tiny. Some birds do. Um, some birds follow it. You sort of have generally have the opposite with some other uh, species of animals. But yeah, there's um some birds seem to be larger farther north as well. Yeah, no, and it's really cool. I mean, you see it in penguins. Of uh, those emperor penguins are huge. Yeah, yeah, but that size change is just one of yeah, the it's many really because you're just it's just for conserving body heat. Yeah, yeah. There's so many different animals that have figured out just by over time and evolution how to survive in these cold climates. Because remember, not everywhere is Antarctica. Sometimes there are warm periods, you know, your springs and your summer, and you get your fall and your winter. And each organism has to find a way to survive that. The best at it are the mammals. The mammals are the masters of cold weather with so many different species having adapted across so many different continents and so many different locations. Mammals are really, really good at surviving extreme temperature changes sometimes through a season, sometimes even over a day or night. Um, Fur, being what it is, amazing insulator. Otters are so well insulated, but while they're swimming in water that's basically freezing, their fur is so tightly packed in that they don't even need blubber. They're just so tightly packed in that they're able to insulate and hold on to all of that heat. And then you have animals that do produce blubber, that nice fat that helps to insulate them. I mean, have you looked at a beluga whale? They're chunky. Oh, yeah. No, they are very so, squ- so squishy. But um, the other thing that um, gets brought up when it comes to animals and the cold is to just you know, sleep it off. And this is something that people have been bringing up. Um, bears and other – most mammals don't really hibernate. They go into what's known as a tor- torpor. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. T-O-R-P-O-R. Torpor? Yeah, I think so. 
Yeah. So it's not really a true hibernation. Uh, we'll talk about them in a second. But instead of like just crashing out for months at a time, it's a reduced activity state. So you're still saving calories by not doing much, but you're still waking up and sleeping. Like you're not just knocking out for like three months and then waking up. It's basically just slowing down your energy enough that you can conserve all of the calories you stuffed into your body throughout the um, the fall and the summer season. Uh, there are some rodents and definitely bats that can hibernate. We've actually seen it where bats, if their hibernations are interrupted, it can cause them to lose strength and die. But for them as animals that need to be constantly wasting energy in order to feed, that hibernation cycle is really important to them. When you want to see true hibernation, though, um, you got to go to the reptiles and amphibians. They're the best. Have you all seen, like, the trend of people, like, burying their turtles? Yeah, yeah. I know some, uh, like, some box turtle species need to go through, like, a, an annual um, hibernation cycle to, like, be at perfect, like, the best health. Yeah, some people have been like, what's going on? Why are you burying it? Is it dead? It's like, no, they're just trying to make sure that it can hibernate properly underground. And as, as long as you mark your spot, the turtle's going to be just fine. It would normally do this in the wild. But uh, there are some amphibians, like there are some frogs that will literally freeze themselves and just walk out of it like it's no big deal. So in their case, it's not really hibernation. It's called brumation, basically the same thing. But the reason they're able to pull it off is because for a lot of them, since they're cold-blooded, they don't need as many calories to stay warm as we do. They need to, um, they need very little. And so they can shut down their bodies and run on that little bit of energy and just keep going for months and months at a time and then move when things are a little bit better. Um, my favorite is the alligators because they, <laughs> they're great. Have you, like, I'm sure this happens. You have gators in North Carolina. So, like, have you seen the frozen gators? No, I I have not. I honestly did not we, know we had gators. Uh, they can make their way up there. It's rare, but usually when things freeze over, um, the alligators are the ones who will stick their noses out of the lake, have it freeze over, and they can still survive there because as long as they're still getting air, they'll be just fine. So you just find you go to a lake and you see a gator popsicle just floating right underneath the surface. It's great. I mean, technically, they are a cold weather reptile, so works out just fine. Are they waiting for the ice to thaw, or are they just like chilling? I mean, a little bit of both. Once it thaws out, they'll be able to get a little bit more motion out of it. But yeah, if they need to stay there while it's freezing, they can survive just fine. The reason they're black in color versus a crocodile that's yellow or brown is that black allows them to absorb more sunlight and they're able to survive those colder conditions. I don't care how terrifying a saltwater crocodile is. You throw it up in the winters of North Carolina, it's dead in a week. It can't handle it. It's just that's not what so it's sad built for. because our winters are so meh. Yeah, I mean, this thing is used to living in the Indian Ocean. It doesn't, it's not built for the cold of any kind. Now, Don, you've already got a chance to meet this firsthand with fish. I mean, don't get me wrong. The mammals are great on land, but fish are literally like made entire thriving ecosystems out of like a frozen, harsh wasteland of a water system. And like, how many fish did you catch in frozen lakes? Um, yeah, I, I, over the whole trip, I think we caught around probably, probably close to 40 fish, maybe a little more, I would say. I'm not going to pretend I know everything about the ocean creatures and definitely don't know much about freshwater. How are they alive? Um, I mean, so one, it's these these are overall trout species that are adapted to like very cold water. But uh, I mean, one fish being a cold blooded animal that's some of which are adapted to very cold water have base. It's almost like antifreeze in their blood. Um, their blood won't wouldn't freeze in temperatures where otherwise, like it would, given the fact that they can't thermoregulate. But uh, some species of like polar fish have a, basically an antifreeze-like substance in their blood that prevents them from being frozen, even if the water around them in salt water is below like freezing, where otherwise the waters in their blood could. Uh... And uh, fish, their metabolism just drops incredibly low in the winter, to the point where their heart might only be beating a few times a minute, depending on the species. So they can just exist with very, very little caloric requirements, especially when they're in bodies of water where there's just not a lot of nutrients like like alpine lakes what i'm seeing like from all of this and from picking up all this information is that most things that live in the cold are big bulky and don't move very fast and honestly that fits a good chunk of the ice types that pokemon has put into the game yeah it's the 
the designs and the stat spreads of a lot of ice types are very unfortunate for how the type is set up from a game. I like hyper offensive ice types. Yes, um, but ice types and like the uh, ice type is an amazing offensive typing. You hit a lot of very relevant types for good damage of great coverage. But defensively, ice is a pretty rough typing. You have some of the most weaknesses, and you're weak to a lot of very good types. And Game Freak really seems to love making low bulky ice types, which aren't really able to be bulky because of their typing. Um, and when they do occasionally make a fast offensive ice plot type, like a Weavile or a Chain Pow, um, they're always extremely good, at least in their era. Yeah. I said the best bulky ice type is probably Glastrier, right? Yeah, or um, uh, Ice Rider Calyrex. Oh yeah, yeah, say yeah. In my mind, same, same. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Of the of the, I think they finally made a bulky Ice type by just incredibly min maxing it as a trick room mo Pokemon. Um, and there are some other good bulky Ice types. Obviously, Articuno gets a shout out. Out. Um, I know there's another one that Lucas wants to talk about that occasionally does stuff, but it's probably not the greatest. Um, but yeah, like there's a few bulky ice types with the glass year and ice rider were probably the peak of bulky ice types. And there's a few, we see Mamoswine. Mamoswine did, might be the only ice type to ever win the world championships though. Really? Yes. That's in that's 2013, impressive. uh, Mamoswine won the world championships at the time, uh, Landorus and Thunderous were on pretty much every team and Mamoswine with, um, I can't remember if it was Thick Fat or Oblivious, but Oblivious would have been nice because I know that doesn't block confusion, just detract. Um, and Mamo Swine could just Choice Scarf, be, couldn't be Prankster Thunderwave by Thunderous, and it could one shot both of them with ice moves. Um, so I think it was Areshamati used it to win Worlds that year, and it was just a great pick. That's nice, though. I mean, I loved Mamo Swine. It was one of my favorite Pokemons to ever play with in Gen 4. So it's, it's nice a very to know cool some... Pokemon. Uh, no pun intended. Yeah, well, maybe. But no, I do yeah. think, and I think Mamoswine's not bad right now. It's, it it's kind of weird because it has such a huge HP stat, but its defenses are pretty low. But um, being immune to Intimidate is good, and Ice Ground is incredible offensive typing. Um, so I could see it. It, it would probably be a little tough to use right now, but I definitely it could be solid. Anything that doesn't get intimidated by Incineroar is nice. And can slap it with high horsepower. If if they had given it headlong rush, it would be great. But it still has to make do. We kind of flowed on into it. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the ice types we brought up. So we kind of all decided to bring out one or two ice types. Um, Chris, if you want to do yours first, because mine might get a little salty, and I like to start things on a positive note. Okay. So uh, I'm going to start off right now, and I'm going to say I do not know why this Pokemon is an ice type, but it is, so it counts. <laughs> this is going to be <laughs> the least ice discussion in this whole episode because we're going to talk about Mr. Ryan. Boy, howdy! It sure feels like time for the Discord to collapse. <laughs> is it purely um because of its uh name pun? It honestly might be because of the name pun. Like that that might be why. Because overall, like Mr. Ryan itself is based off of charlie chaplin and his character from the silent movie era of the tramp are you all familiar with the work of charlie chaplin oh yeah the man's a legend charlie chaplin's one of the one of the like original true movie stars that hollywood had he very much like transcended his humor transcended cultures like worldwide people knew who charlie chaplin was he uh his character the tramp lucas passed the silhouette test that you always talk about uh, where he's got the baggy pants, tight coat, large shoes, bowler hat, cane, uh, the toothbrush mustache. Like, it's a very iconic look that people recognized all over. I think that one thing that is true in comedy is that slapstick humor is funny everywhere. Yeah, it kind of has universal appeal. Uh, I've seen chimpanzees is... laugh at it. I think that's why, like, he had a lot, as a lot of success. A lot of success he did, success that he had, is because of just the kind of humor that he was able to do in the silent era was very much like slapstick. But there's, uh, he came out. Yeah, he was born and raised in England. Uh, I think he actually learned or trained under the guy who popularized like the pie in the face gag. Um. 
Fred Carno is his name. Um, that must have been so wild to see for the first time, the first pie in the face. <laughs> Right, and that's, so, yo, that's the man. That's the bro. That's him right there. Wow, Cust who would have thought cream pie not being eaten but thrown? We're talking like nine, like nineteen hundred, like eight, like Chaplin was born in eighteen eighty nine. So like nineteen hundred, someone threw a pie in the face and it was like, oh my god, this is the funniest thing I've ever like, seen. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, but Chaplin toured a toured a lot uh, in the UK and Europe. Um, before he came to Hollywood and really sort of took everything by storm. Uh, the trip character actually came up in his second film. Uh, so it, it all just kind of happened very, very quickly, but there was uh, so many of the part, part of what's interesting too, about the success that Chaplin saw is he was still making silent movies. Once sound entered the field, um, he did not want to do a lot of talky talky movies uh and and his films still succeeded like modern times is a terrific terrific movie if you look at rhyme you can kind of see that same little silhouette aspect between the tramp character uh and and what chaplin had going for him between the cane he's got the big shoes he definitely has a coat uh the mustache the bowler hat like I I see zero dispute that this is Charlie Chaplin in tap dancing ice shenanigan mon. I'm not really sure why it is. I mean, Charlie Chapman's a pretty cool dude. <laughs> he's mm. pretty he's pretty cool. Uh, I mean, I'll... it could also be the fact that he pretty much mastered sliding around like he was on ice, basically on what it looked what is concrete. Like his physical comedy was is was still taught is still taught today and how he can move around. Like most people don't care what pantomime is anymore. It's very it's like the lowest form of theater. But like the way he moves his body, the way he clearly maps every step to look like he's slipping and sliding around. You could imagine he could be literally walking on like a sidewalk and you would think it was made of ice the way he slips and slides around. It, it's incredible. Now, uh, just a couple little fun facts that, that uh, I like to highlight about Chaplin, but he's one of the founding members of United Artists, the, the company that's still around today. Um, one of the reasons that he got started doing that is that he wanted to, he wanted to make it more possible for artists to be the driving force behind the films as opposed to being a part of the, or being forced into the studio system that was what Hollywood was in the early 1900s. Uh, so United Artists has had a very, very long storied run of producing high quality films. Uh, did you know that Charlie Chaplin actually lost a Charlie Chaplin lookalike contest? I have heard about that. That's hysterical. I think he got fifth. Uh, but it was definitely not first or second. That's funny. No, that's comedy. <laughs> That that that's a that's that's going and then I guess on a uh, uh, on a on a sadder note, but so he like within a couple months of him passing, his coffin was actually grave robbed. Oh, and that's they just sent gross. A, they sent a ransom note for six hundred thousand dollars to uh, his wife, and ultimately, like they the dudes got caught and he got reburied. Uh, I think in like some kind of theft deterrent system but just something so that no one could steal his body again but like that's i mean that's the kind of celebrity we're talking about with charlie chaplin is that like people actually stole his body to hold it for ransom it's a weird pokemon for sure mr rhyme like no one this is not a pokemon anyone is asking for no one was asking for charlie chaplin mr mime no one was asking for a new version of mr mime much less a tap dancing Charlie Chaplin version. But I mean, I honestly, though, he's not terrible. Like his stats are, you know, meh defensively. But like the fact that he could clean screens and what's that one for some reason, slow bro and slow king get it. The one that makes snow and like flip turn chilly reception. Oh. It's like they tell yeah, a I bad like... joke and la awkwardly leave the room. It's like how the move works. <laughs> And honestly, so the part, if parting shot is swearing and storming out, this is like they tell like a bad pun and like do the little like play me off Johnny that the guys on Family Guy do and dance off screen. 
Yeah, if Mr. Ryan was allowed to be in Scarlet and Violet, he would be one of the best users of this whole thing. Like, he would be one of the best ones. Hands down. Nah, he's, he's a fun Pokemon. And, and Ice, Psychic, Ice Psychic is a good type because it negates a lot. Uh, it negates at least one of Ice's main weaknesses. Yeah, but now you're weak to Dark and Ghost. And Bugs. Don't yeah. ruin it, Don. <laughs> No, no, no worry. We're not going to ruin things. I'm going to ruin things. Um, the ice type I decided to talk about is one I hate because of its name, and only its name. I hate Dugong a lot. <laughs> it is by far the worst named Pokemon in the game. If you have a worse one for me... Lucas, you have to remember that this was made... They haven't harnessed their abilities for portmanteau and like wordplay. This was like early try they literally named it after the wrong animal how are you thinking i'm supposed to take this i thought you were mad that it was called dude d-e-w no no that's fine that's that's fine by me the fact that they named it after the one marine mammal that is the opposite of a seal or sea lion in any way is stupid like if you don't know what a dugong is they are relatives to manatees and elephants. They live in tropical climates, they eat tons of vegetation, they move super slow in shallow waters, and the main difference between a dugong and a manatee is that a dugong kind of has a tail similar to a dolphin, whereas a manatee has the round circular pattern. Dugong, the Pokemon, is a seal, which is literally the polar opposite of everything a manatee is. Like, a manatee, like, a manatee and dugongs, like, they're all tropical. Most seals are going to be living in cold climates. They are mostly, they are carnivorous. They tend to be a lot faster. They're a lot smarter. They got everything wrong. And what's worse, they got it wrong in multiple languages. Like, go ahead and look up dugong in multiple languages. That Pokemon's name is still dugong in every other language. Like, they still name it. Like, I believe in French, it's named manatee instead. Like, I get really mad. I like it. What I will say, Lucas, in defense, is that if in order to acquiesce to what you are complaining about, you're either changing the appearance or changing the name. Independently, the appearance is great. Dugong is a great design, Pokemon design. And independently of the creature itself, Dugong, D-E-W, is a great name. I'm just saying. You got If we split the two apart, it'd be great because you are absolutely correct. Dugong is part seal and part mermaid. The design itself is really neat. When you saw this Pokemon in Gen 1, it looked pretty, but I still hate the name. Uh, the fins are very frilly and beautiful, and the horn is meant to break ice. Um, the body is white like the camouflage of beluga whale. This thing has been adapted to living in cold and icy conditions, and it is carnivorous. You can see it with the teeth. It's got a lot of really cool features in it. I just, it, the name takes me out of it because, like, seals are awesome. Seals are some of the smartest, most capable animals in the ocean. There is a reason the United States military still uses them whenever they need to go check and look for stuff in deep water. Mainly because I think seals and sea lions were less likely to run away. I think when they tried it with dolphins once, a group of there was one uh, story where a group of dolphins uh, were sent out for marine stuff. They met a wild pot of dolphins and just never came back. So, oops. Um, but um, <laughs> they defected. <laughs> yeah, they defected to the other side. <laughs> um, Dugong is apparently able to swim at about eight knots, so close to nine point four miles per hour. Uh, a real seal can reach over 15 miles per hour underwater. So real ones can actually go faster than a dugong. And if you've never seen them move, yes, on land, a seal is pathetic. It, it, it caterpillars everywhere. It's bouncy and it's weird to walking. Put them in the water and their spines are basically made out of like, like silly, laffy taffy. They can kind of bend and move however way they want. They use that bendiness to kind of twist and turn their way through the water to catch their prey. The one thing that is off is that with Dugong, it has a tail, and it's lost its back leg, so that's where it's like kind of mermaidy. And I would love to imagine the sailors in the frozen Arctic of like the Pokemon world, like there, Captain, it's a mermaid. Maybe it has fire. Please don't freeze me. So I like Dugong. Um, it's now that it's back in the game, it's a very, has a very annoying little niche of knowing fake out Parish song, and I think U-turn. So you can do stuff really? with that. 
Yeah, yeah. Paris song teams use dugong now. <laughs> that's that's the wildest thing I've heard all day. It gets encore too. <laughs> Dugong's got an, ins- an honestly insane move pool that really doesn't make sense. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at it now. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if you look at it's like normal move pool of like ice and normal moves and all that, but then you just crank down to like the TMs it can get. And it's just it's a lot, man. It's a lot. I like how it learns weather ball. Again, one of my favorite weird little moves. And its stats are very much Gen 1. It was not there for the power creep. It hasn't gotten anything good. But like it was not. But like, it's got it's got thick fat, which is a good ability. It's got hydration, which is a good ability. Um it's got Ice Body's pretty good. Um it's got yeah, not the best stats, but it can be annoyingly bulky. So it, it's clear that there's a place for it in the Pokemon world. And one thing I will say with the whole white fur thing. Everyone knows what that's usually from. That's for baby seals. The reason that they lose that fur, that eventually they do develop their own blubber, in order to kickstart that process, seal fat, like the seal body fat content in their milk, is the highest of any animal. Would you like to guess how many days and how many months or how many weeks or whatever the seal has to keep, has to feed milk to its baby? I'm going to say it's going to either be like two weeks or like two years. Okay, what do you think, Chris? Uh, five years. In these animals, it's less than a week. It's I figured it was gonna. Week. I know it's super crazy calorie dense, so I figured it was gonna be either like weirdly short or like crazy long, just because they have to put on so much. Yeah, no, they'll they'll start putting it off on their own, and once they start going to hunting, but like the they get all their milk in three days because that fat content is so high. Like seals really do produce. It's crazy. I guess that makes sense too, because it's kind of like you need to get them adjusted for the climate that they're in, like ASAP. Yeah, no. What they basically did for this Pokemon was they shoved a whole bunch of marine mammals from cold climates into a blender and hit puree, and we got this beautiful creature. I mean, again, it's a good design. It's pretty. It's got fun little moves, but I hate the name. And that's why I was taught to talk about it. All right, Don. You're up. What frosty critter did you drag out for us? All right. I did a personal favorite. Um, can you guys guess? I'll give you each one guess. There's only 65. This is the best chances we have. It is not the ice <laughs> table. Dang it. Mammoth I'll give you a, I'll, You want a hint? I'll give you guys. I'll give you each a hint. Okay. It is maybe the worst typing in the game. Oh, sh- oh no. It's the dinosaur, isn't it? No. Aurorus? Oh, it's no. Not. <laughs> There's a worse it's not type. Aurorus? Aurorus is rock ice. Ice so, dark? No. It's got two 4X weaknesses. Ice bug. Snom. It is snom. snom. <laughs> it is snom. <laughs> the boy. All right, Him. yeah, so. Snom. I, I like Frostlass too, but I wanted to talk about snom, and this is probably my only chance to. So Snom is a little guy, first of all. Um, and Snom is based on a critters, though. Um, so there is the Jewel Caterpillar. Uh, Dalciridae is the uh, is a group of moths, the Zygonoid moths, um, which have um, caterpillars also known as Jewel Caterpillars. There's different species that have different colors. Um, there's one that's clear and kind of silvery, much like Snom. They sort of have like little lumps on them but they're as those little lumps are like actually gelatinous spikes and um if like a predator like an ant or something tries to take a chunk off they get basically a mouthful of gooey spike and they kind of just have to deal with that while the caterpillar scooches away i kind of want to poke it yeah and they sort of mentioned that how it um it disguised itself as an icicle on branches and they did uh it uses the um, the air to create icicle like spikes on its back, so it's also sort of has like a temporary spike being icicle um, as a defensive mechanism. So we see that in Snom, and we see that in the Jewel Caterpillars. And uh, I would imagine um, the other kind of less adorable uh, critter that I think Snom draws from a little bit. Are you guys familiar with glacier worms? I have never heard of a glacier worm. Now also known as that. ice worms. Oh, I don't like that. Sorry, the first thing that zoomed up was like an extra, like the super close up of its mouth. 
So yeah, here you go, Chris. Enjoy. No, this I see nightmare. it. I see it. I see yeah, I'm gonna it. put it in the Discord anyway. Look at it. Look at it. That's horrible. So the ice worms, though, are a small species of worm, and they're very unique. They live in like glacial areas, in the walls of crevasses, uh, in avalanche cones. But like the most interesting ones live within the ice of glaciers. Um, and they can move between the ice crystals themselves using the specialized bristles on their bodies to kind of like slip between them. Um, they're one of the very few animals um, that lives its entire life cycle in conditions um, below zero degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius in terms of body temperature because um, they just live inside of glaciers the whole time. It's like the opposite of that one that lives by the volcanoes. Yes, basically. Yeah, you would say they're an extremophile and they eat. All, and like they're very very interesting so one they eat snow algae and bacteria that are also within the glaciers um so that's kind of fun their scientific name means um sun avoiding because they'll they'll actually come out on top of glaciers at night sometimes but they always go back into the ice before the sun comes up um and their their body they have a very low and very narrow optimal body temperature if they uh, were really below 32 degrees um they die um, and then if they go, I mean, they're inside like the glacier, which has a stable temperature of basically exactly 32. And then um, if they go almost any temperature above freezing, um, the their bodies basically denature like at just 41 degrees Fahrenheit. So five degrees Celsius, um, their structures dissociate and they just melt. Oh, my God. That's horrifying. What? That's horrible. <laughs> That's actually how they tunnel through the ice. Some scientists believe they like travel through like microscopic fissures and some things they sort of use some sort of chemical that like melts the ice around them. So they sort of like have a pocket. Um, but like they max out at a couple centimeters. So they're very small. Um, and they're normally they can be black, blue or white, which is kind of fun. Um, and they're very, very numerous. Like the, uh, there's a glacier in the Northern Cascades, the, um, Seattle glacier. Um, and it's, it's it's indicated to have like at least seven billion of them. So th there's a lot of them. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. You win. Uh, you win for most terrifying Pokemon. Enjoy your trophy. Yeah. This is this is a spooky. I did not appreciate you bringing this one down. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're I at the we same just... time they're so non-threatening. If you just put your hand near one, it literally just turns into goo. That sounds really sad. <laughs> it melts. I know, right? Like they just melt at 41 <laughs> degrees. And if they go, so basically they have to be between 32 and 41 degrees at all times. That is, I know I have a coworker like that who likes the cold a bit too much. So yeah, I kind of want to tell him about this worm now and I'm going to do it tomorrow. Yeah. It's oh like the, and the enzymes they use to digest and like inside their bodies, those can also just denature. Like a, basically just a couple degrees above 32. So even before that, there can be like permanently damaged before they just reach full on melting. That is an extremophile. Like I have there's like 77 of these guys running around species wise. Oof. Wow. You actually blew my mind today, Don. Thank you for that. Yeah, these guys are they're super cool. Like no one talks about this. No one. Why are we the only podcast talking about this? This is awesome. I love this. Melty it's worms for everybody. It's go Everyone, look up the melting worms. All right. So last one. I kind of wanted to... I, I pulled up one last one because I like having four. It just rounds out pretty well. We have to talk about the ice type. The iciest of all ice types because we probably won't get a chance to talk about them in any other category. What are your thoughts on the Reggies? Specifically, Reggie Ice. I like him. Um, I think I had a dream once they got Meteor Beam, and I was really excited. And he did not, in fact, get Meteor Beam. I think Reg Ice is my least favorite of the original Reggies, but he's cool, I guess. Well, his, what, his puzzle was the one where you just had to stand in the middle of the room and not move for like 20 minutes. Yeah, he's kind of a jerk in that way. I, 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 I loved the Reggies, though. The little side quest was so cool. Yeah, I'll be honest. The kids these days won't know how good it was when they got Reggie Draco and Reggie Lecky. It's like, oh, yeah, just show up and touch the thing. No, you had to learn Braille. 
You had to learn Braille. You had to bring a Waylord. You had to get all this stuff right, and that was awesome. Now the kids are like, oh, yeah, just uh, just use cut on this door. Just knock it. Just just play a little flute. Like, no, no, no. You have to go go learn Japanese sign language or whatever you need to do for the next quest. Like, figure some other language and then they'll learn this because it was way more fun when we were kids. But if you've ever decided to go through the Pokedexes of Reggie Ice, it says a couple of weird things. Number one, it mentions that it's made from ice, from the Ice Age, um, from Antarctica. So we now know that Antarctica is real in the Pokemon world. Like, they do have an Antarctica. So there is a place without bears in the Pokemon world. So we, we have established that. Now, the second thing is they keep repeating this number. Negative 328 degrees Fahrenheit. Over and over and over again. They're very specific that this is the wind and the breeze that it is blowing at. Negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Chris, would you like to take a guess as to why? Because it, that's equal to however many dump trucks it takes to freeze. Why are you like this, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> so it took some digging, but I was able to find it. Negative 328 degrees Fahrenheit is decept. It just it's a sliver close to the temperature of liquid nitrogen. That is the ice this thing is putting out. Like it is walking liquid nitrogen. That it's spreading around the air. It's just, which makes it all the more terrifying if you know what liquid nitrogen can do. I make some really good ice cream, I can tell you that. Oh yeah, that's in my notes right here. Liquid nitrogen is used today in healthcare, industrial work, and making excellently smooth ice cream. Don, have you ever had liquid nitrogen ice cream? Yes, and it's because the, uh, unless you want to talk about why it makes the ice cream smooth. No, 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 go right ahead. <laughs> yeah, so ice cream... Um... The faster ice cream freezes, the smaller the ice crystals in the ice cream and the smoother the texture. So by using something super cold like liquid nitrogen, you get ice cream that much, has much smaller ice crystals and is much, much smoother. It's really good, and it's a reason it's a lot harder to get because liquid nitrogen isn't exactly a joke. This stuff is pretty harsh. I mean, in the Pokedex, it says that Reggie Ice can melt, can like freeze you instantly. Uh, liquid nitrogen is... um. It doesn't even do it instantly, but how liquid nitrogen works, like, I had to look it up, like, what exactly happens to someone who gets dunked in liquid nitrogen. Um, First off, I apparently... saw that in the uh, accurate documentary, Jason X. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if your room has a corner, but could you go sit in it for, like, a minute and think about where, what you've done? What type of house do you think I have where I don't have corners? <laughs> I don't know. I thought your corners would be filled with stuff. You have a full house. You they just, are. I've been to your house. It's either loaded with spear guns for fishing or a meat fridge or fish. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. My corners are pretty full. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Anyway, I stand by <laughs> um, that movie. Yeah. I, I feel like you would. <laughs> but in reality, um, if you were to get dunked in liquid nitrogen, you'd have a few seconds to save yourself. Because you would basically get, like, a vapor barrier around you because it would immediately start boiling off. Yeah, I think that's called, like, the, the lead and frost effect, right? Yeah, so basically you're just war you're warm enough that it would basically make a vapor shield around you and you can get out of it. It's why if you're splashed with liquid nitrogen, you can usually get it off quick enough. But if you're in a pool of the stuff, like, if it's a constant, like, Reggie ice being around you, that's when things get bad. Not only do you get frostbite... But all your internal organs are going to start cooling down and shutting off. And then, worse, all the water in your body is going to start freezing and expanding and rupturing every cell and muscle strand you have. You pass out in agony and die within less than five minutes. Reggie Ice is probably one of the scariest Pokemon in the game because of it. Weirdly enough, there's another Pokemon that does this, and it's Glaceon who can just freeze things instantly in the air. But Regiice is just way more terrifying because imagine you're going on an archaeological dig in some cave. You brought your Waylord and stuff, and all of a sudden the temperature just drop, and you pass out in agony as the ice monster just goes on, on, on as it comes for you. Like It's a crazy fun Pokemon. Again, not as crazy as the worms, but it's still pretty great. In any case, I mean, the Reggies are all great. Reggie Ice does have a ridiculous special defense stat. And some people have tried, tried making something cool out of it. But I'm guessing not so much. 
not that great in battle? Um, I think I know uh uh Aaron Zhang Cybertron just uh put up a video using it. I do think with Terra it can be good. It's got crazy special bulk. And with the defense boost from ice, it's very bulky and it can't have its stats drop. Um it's got ice body. I think it's like usable right now. I don't think it's the best. I think it competes with some other ice types. But um it's probably not in the lot right now with the buff to snow. I, I would imagine its bulk is pretty crazy. I don't think it gets freeze dry though, and I think that would really be good for it. Yeah, I feel like most ice types need to have freeze dry. It does get thunderbolt. Like it's got it's got ice ice electric coverage, which is never bad, and it's got enough special attack. Yeah, anything that can run anything that can run a uh, thunder and uh, anything that can run thunderbolt and ice beam is always good. Welcome. I mean, in any case, it's the Reggies aren't exactly a Pokemon we normally get to talk about because they're not really biology based. So I wanted to take this time to talk about the Pokemon that is pure ice, literally just a talking, weird little block of ice meant on, you know, being made up in the image of the continent dragger. But he's really cool. And I, I feel like I feel weird because I was going to be like, all right, here's the plan. We talk about the Pokemon and then we end on Reggie Ice because he's the strongest. But Don kind of stole the show with the worm, so I'm kind of flustered here. I thought you would know that, like the worms. They're cool. They're fun little guys. You do like the no. You did a great job. I just feel bad. <laughs> just, I brought the one Pokemon. Like yeah, the liquid nitrogen Pokemon. Nothing's gonna beat that. Then you have the frozen worms. Like I don't like. Again, ice types were never my favorite. I never used ice types in the games. But after this, maybe I'll use more than just Mammoth Swine. Maybe I will use more than just him because as much as they are a fragile, broken type coverage system, they're getting stronger. The fact that Snowscape exists means that the game understands that ice types could be better. There are some really good ones out there. And their designs, there aren't like, I'm scrolling through the list here. There aren't really any bad designs. Yes, there is an ice cream Pokemon. We know the joke. Get over it. But everything else here... Like, most of these are really good. Like, the designs of them are unique, and they really attach not just to the fact that they're ice, but they really snatch on to, like, what exactly cold they're talking about, from icebergs to frozen worms to Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> like, they did a really... Baxcalibur? Baxcalibur's a cool dragon. Oh, we have a kaiju episode in the wings for when uh, the next Godzilla movie comes out. We are 100% doing kaiju Pokemon. Because that thing is rad. So sick. But in the meantime, I think that's all the time we have for the ice types. I do want to thank you guys for joining me in this fun little romp of learning about these critters. So thank you for bringing your monsters. Always appreciated. If you guys are ever interested in us talking about a different type or a specific group of Pokemon, let us know. We're on our Discord. We're always listening whenever you guys leave something. And we'd love getting a chance to do these talks with y'all. I mean, again, guys, thank you so much for bringing your ice type Pokemon. I really, I love it. Oh, no, thank you. This was a, this was a fun idea. <laughs> the worms Actually, are just going really... to, is going to sleep with the lights on tonight and <laughs> yeah. he's going to put the heat on. He's like, they're not going to get me. <laughs> the worms won't get me. The worms won't get me. Not me, not Someone's the Someone's going to offer him an ice water tomorrow and he's going to smack it away. <laughs> <laughs> no! <laughs> Oh, look at that, Lucas. It's below 40. Don't you say it. Shh, shh, shh. Do you hear them? They're wiggling. The worms don't melt. <laughs> they won't They're be melting. They're in the walls. They're in the walls. They're in the goddamn ice walls! Honestly, I'm, I, I'm excited for, like... Honestly, Glacier Worms sounds like a sci-fi original movie, too. There were a few about Glacier, like, disease worms. I remember out Ice Spiders. That was it. Was... Ice Spiders was a good one. Yeah, no, that was a really nice one. I'm sorry, we're getting off track. If anyone wants to listen to us talk more about ice spiders, please let us know, because we will, and it's fun. Until then, have a great rest of your day or night. We'll see you guys in the next episode. Bye, everybody.